Welcome to the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. I'm your host, Jacob Cooper, best-selling author of Life After Breath and the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. For those of you who are new to my channel, we thank you for tuning in. Please make sure to hit that subscribe button and bell notification to stay up to date for weekly podcasts and interviews coming your way. Today's guest in the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder is Dr. Ingrid Hankala. Ingrid had a profound near-death experience like myself, and also like myself, she had hers at a very young age, around the age of three years old when I had mine. So Ingrid is going to be a wonderful guest, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about her near-death experience, her current work, and some of the lessons that she's gained uh, over her near-death experience. So without further ado, we welcome Dr. Ingrid Hankala on the Wisdom Jacobs Ladder. Dr. Ingrid Hankala, thank you so much for coming here as my honored guest in the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder. I know I was privileged to meet you a couple years ago, I think, in the Philadelphia Convention for IONS, and we certainly connected there, and I've been a big fan of the work that you do. And why I say that is, and I'm sure our viewers will find this out, is you are an international sensation. Mm. You reach you know, beyond the U.S. into so many different pockets of the world that do need to hear your incredible words and story. But for some of my view, viewers on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder, take us to a little bit of a closer glance as to who is Dr. Ingrid Hankala and what brought you to the position that you're in as this incredible best-selling author, fell, fellow near-death experiencer. Take us to some of the genesis of your journey. Wow. Thank you so much for having me here, Jacob. And what an introduction. I feel very, very honored. Wow. Yeah, the journey has been long, has been difficult and has been amazing at the same time. As you, I had a near that experience when I was just a little one, little, little child. So yeah, for, for many people, that's kind of like difficult to understand how a little child can even remember any of these sure yeah yes but this is what uh is makes it the most incredible of, of all is and i am going to bring all that clarity of how it has been for me and how the path of let's call it oneness the path of communion with god the path of consciousness has opened for me and it all began with a near that experience when I was close to three years old in which I drowned. Wow. Yes. So, so for viewers listening, Dr. Ingrid and I were roughly around the same age to the T at three years old when we had our near-death experiences. And so certainly there's a lot of parallels that we have. And I think we could certainly get into uh, the you know, just kind of like the explanation as to how we maybe can remember and what that could teach us about young children. But I think my viewers are more interested to really hear what happened to you when you were close to three. And take us through your journey, because um, I know as a writer, there's a, sh there's a saying that we have, and I know you've written a beautiful book. It's called A Brightly Guided Life, if, if I'm right or wrong. And, um, and so... Yeah. I know you know this, there's a saying that says, uh, show, don't tell, which means that you want to take people there with you as if they're you, which is a challenge of near-death experiencers. But to your best abilities, take us through that moment. What was going on when you had your near-death experience? I'd like to hear the narrative. Yes, yes. I, I am very honored to share and to actually, even as I share in answer that question of how is it possible to even remember mm -hmm. <laughs> or what is this whole um sense of being human and come here to experience contrast and that contrast is what opened the door to memory <laughs> the door to remember the door to know the difference what am i talking about then what happened is that uh, back then uh, I was born in Colombia and I was living there with my parents, my sisters and my parents, uh, they had to go to work very early in the morning 
and they would leave us at the care of a maid. And this was a young lady. She really didn't pay much attention to anything we were doing when my parents were not around. One morning, very early, they left for work. And she, again, went busy to do her stuff. And my oldest sister, she was close to four, me being close to three, just look at each other like, let's go play in the patio. And then we went to the patio and the, the problem there is that there was a big tank. And the purpose of this tank was to collect water for hand washing clothes or whatever else. And then Jacob, this tank was about 900, oh, could hell about 900 gallons of water. So it was a oh. pretty big tank. Wow. It's a big kahuna. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so it was like, uh, it was better that the babies are not playing in the patio. And then first thing, we phone a ball, let's play cash across the tank. Mm. So we phone a couple of stools, climb the walls of the tank. Mm. Next to the tank, there was a flat surface for scrubbing. So my sister sat there. So she was a little bit more, let's call it, she was safer. I went to the other side and I was leaning very precariously in this tank. But hey, you're having fun. Who's thinking about any danger? <laughs> then she grabbed the ball. She threw the ball, didn't apply enough force, fell on the, it was floating. It was, fell on the water, was floating. And then I thought, eh, I can grab it. Hmm. I leaned forward. The moment I touched the ball, it rolled. And I lost my balance and fell in the tank. Wow. Oh, 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 oh. The first feeling, Jacob, was the sense of the water was frigid cold. I was born in Bogota, Colombia, high up in the Andes. People have the misconception, Colombia, hot weather. No, nope. if you're up in the mountains, it's, not co it's cold weather. So A higher altitude, yes. Exactly. So the water probably was, uh, had to be 30, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So imagine that the shock of this frigid water was the sense that like, I kind of lost my breath. Like, ooh, and I went into this water, this frigid call. And from then, mm. it came the absolute horror of realizing why I cannot breathe. Mm. I never have been in a pool. I never, we didn't have a bathtub. So my head never have been under the water. Mm. And when first the cold, then second, that realization, why I cannot breathe. So imagine the sense of wanting to escape out of this horrendous oh, <laughs> sensation. I, I, this place was enormous. I've been there myself, hence my first book, Life After Breath, in which you know I suffocated as well, too. It is the most, you can only know it until you have it, and it is the scariest, most traumatic. I, don't, I do not wish it on anyone, but yeah. yes, what you're, I feel like I'm, I'm hearing my own experience, you know, heard you know, through you. It just, again, it comes back to that point of that oneness and that unity consciousness that we all have, yeah but please go on. And then from that terror, that's when this word contrast. Contrast. <laughs> play, contrast. Wow. Experiencing contrast. What happened there? When I was in this state of absolute horror in just a blink, the last thing I saw is the darkness of this space. And the moment I enter into that state of peace and calmness and serenity, light. I saw a light that came from the bottom. And when I saw this light, it was that sense like, oh, now there is light. Hmm. And this light was soft, but was a uh, strong enough to illuminate my whole watery surrounding. So now I am in the light. Wow. And the other contrast is that the last thing I heard before I drowned was my heart beating. And it was beating very loud. I could hear it like a drum in my head. Imagine in that state of horror, panic, and my heart is like boom, 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 boom. Quiet. Hmm. 
So that peace came with that silence, that stillness, that quietness. And when I refer about this silence, Jacob, I said the silence behind the silence. Wow. This silence was so supreme that even after my near death for years, I craved that silence. I wanted, I went to closets, chapels, <laughs> under the bed. It was like, I wanted that silence so bad. But I, and I, and I was mad because I, I don't know. I, I, it was the sense why I cannot find it. <laughs> mm. So the, the next thing is like, now I am in that stillness, quietness, silence, peace. And then I started to see bubbles. Hmm. And the bubbles were surrounded by light. Wow. And then now it was that sense of the child like, oh, there's bubbles. Hmm. And then it was like trying to chase that bubbles that I turn around. And it's when I saw my body. Wow. And my body was in the water. And look, there's few things and something that I just have been discussing and thinking recently, Jacob, but is that when I saw the body, the only thing that really kind of caught my attention in the sense of like, whoa, was the expression of the eyes. The mm. eyes were open. Like mm. I said, the last thing I saw was the darkness of the space. The eyes in the body were open. Mm. But you know, it's incredible the difference when the eyes are full of life and where the when the eyes are not. So it was the body, seeing the body and the eyes open like empty, like a shell. It was like a complete void. There was nothing there. Yes. And then that was the thing that like kind of gave me the sense like, whoa, this, this impression of like, whoa, that body is empty. But at the same time, it was the sense of like familiarity. Like, mm. oh, that's normal. <laughs> that's normal. It's something that you might have seen or known before coming into fruition in front of you. Yes. And then it comes the next contrast and it was that I was born as a very sick child. And sometimes we wonder how, oh, why this child is sick. And, and throughout my whole life experience, I have realized and discovered that everything has a purpose. Mm -hmm. And in my case, the purpose of being born this sick for this experience that I was having at that moment was offering me Again, these were enough contrast to see. <gasps> this is how I felt for almost three years of my life, completely unwell. I didn't even know how it was to feel well. Hmm. And now that I am experiencing absolute well-being, hmm. what do you think, you got? <laughs> I saw that body and I'm like, I don't want to go back there. Hmm. So if I would have been born as a very healthy child, and this happened, I might not even remember it later because it's a continuation of a well-being hmm. state of, of, of where you're just doing okay. No, this offered me the possibility to even make that decision at that moment. Oh, no, I don't want to go back to that body. Hmm. Wow. How? Because I know with a lot of near-death experiencers, they're... They obviously don't stay there. Otherwise, it would be a death experience, not a near-death experience. But they're either provided with autonomy. They say, hey, you know, in my case, it's like whatever you want to do, up to you. Or some are said, hey, you know, Uncle Joe needs you. Your daughter needs you. Your son needs you. Or there's more work to do. Was there any particular position that you're put in to choose? Or was it where you told, hey, Ingrid, Ingrid you know, you need to come back or you wanted to come back. Like, how did that all unfold? Oh, no, no, no. This keeps going in like a very, very deep experience in which my decision was not to go back. And I turned around and I left the body behind. Wow. And when I left the body behind, I started to see flowers. Hmm. And the flowers were blooming from nowhere. 
Wow. And then I was picked by the flowers. So imagine that even the sense of dimension disappeared because now I am being picked by flowers. Talk and about I'm a contrast. Your body's in water and here you are seeing flowers. I mean, what a contrasting field. Yeah. Yes, yes. And you know, the, the meaning of water later in my life, realizing that water is a symbol of rebirth. Mm. Cleansing. Yes, yes, yes. Purification. And now I'm being picked by flowers. And I am like floating in these flowers. And I put the analogy that it was like going back into the womb. Like where you don't have to do anything. Mm. It's like you're just being carried. You're just being done. Sure. And then I am in this. <laughs> I said, I'm just there relaxed in my complete just... <gasps> Please be in this. And then it's when in a blink, I appear in the maid's room. And I'm floating above her. And I looked at her and I, I said, oh, that's Maria. <laughs> and Maria was completely unaware of what was happening. She was listening to the radio. She was listening to soap operas. And I, this was that that real when people ask about realities like and that clear and that that i can't even remember what she was listening in the radio even if you were in the room you would have more awareness that you are from hearing what's you know going on with her and knowing her thoughts and here you are in a totally different place it's amazing that you were able to have that evidential awareness of someone totally outside of your body totally in another house and knowing what she was doing Yes, then I, since she didn't pay any attention, she was completely unaware. In another blink, Jacob, like that, I appear in my mom's path. Like I said, my mom left early for work. She didn't have a car. She's walking. And there's a distance of about 10 minutes away from home to get her to her bus stop. And then my mom is walking and Suddenly, I am floating above her. Wow. And this was, this is probably one, the part that validates the experience, and two, the part in which I think it blows everybody's minds. Because mm -hmm. the moment I said, Oh, that's mom, she stopped. Hmm. She did not hesitate. She did. She didn't even give another step. She knew immediately something is happening at home with one of my babies. Wow. So you were aware that mom had that mother's intuition that we speak about and she had an awareness like like she just kind of stopped and she knew like something's going down. Yes. And the moment she stopped is was that uh this urge in my mom, I said, you mentioned intuition. I said, uh, my mom was a very intuitive person. Mm. But I also say the most important about intuition is to listen to that intuition. Yes. And my mom always did. You know, because uh, again, when people also wonder about intuition, I said, when it comes with that sense of urge, with that sense, it's a feeling, not a head thing. Right. Knowing from your gut, from your heart, is what moved my mom at that moment to turn around and she started to run back home. Wow. And I saw her and the moment I look at my mom, I'm like, oh, I wonder why she's running. Hmm. And then I got distracted because at the end of the road, there was a dog. And the moment I look at the dog, I adore animals. <laughs> I wanted to be with this dog. And this desire, Jacob, brought me immediately to be with the dog. Wow. So it was this, oh, what is going on? And then the moment I turned around and I saw a park and I felt the desire to be in the park, I am in the park. Hmm. So now I'm having fun playing this game of going places. It's all this sense of time and space that we know vanish. And I could be anywhere at any time. Wow. <laughs> and when I'm playing this game of going places, having fun in another flash, in another bling, I am in a realm. Hmm. And this realm was made of pure 
bright, intense, shiny light. Mm. And in this moment is when I felt for the first time in my almost three years of life as Ingrid, the sense that oh, I am home. Mm. I am home. And it was this, like, you know, I always say people, when, when you have, uh, you've been working so hard the whole day to give an analogy and you get to your home and you're like, it's so good to be here. Mm. It was the feeling like, like if I really had missed it and I was now there. Wow. And then, although I was still having a sense of self, it was a, uh, the sense that I was kind of becoming like dissolving with the whole, but that was not all. At this moment, it's also when, although I had seen my body in the water, is when I had that clarity that oh, I am not that. Mm. I am not that. I am this, and this, when I said I am this, I realize myself as a being of light. Hmm. Wow. It's kind of like, if I'm not that, then who am I? And what you are really, what you're aware of is that you are not the body. You are a being of light. Wow. Yes. And that sense of unity and interconnectedness and expansion started to happen. And I said, at that moment, I was still having a sense, a sense of self, but that even dissolved. Sometimes that's why for, and, and I have really not mentioned this before, Jacob, but sometimes that's why I think that my experience is more than what we could describe as a near that experience. I call it that experience. A, 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 a death experience. Yes, because it went beyond. And even talking later with, with some people, they, they even said, oh, you never really disconnect. You never. And I said, I actually, what happened after is that it was, I experienced the sense of what we could, some describe it non-self, some call it emptiness. I call it nothingness. Mm. And how can I describe this? There's no description, actually. There's no words. There's only, let's call it, we could use analogies. We could use what we A lot we of me metaphor yeah, examples. metaphors. But when I say nothingness, people get scared. But I said, no, is that nothingness? But at the same time, is wholeness. How is this possible? So I said, imagine that you there is a stadium when somebody share with me this analogy i thought this is perfect <laughs> in the middle of the stadium there is a box okay and all you knew about yourself is that box mm. and suddenly the box opens mm. and is the realization oh, yeah it's nothingness because it's nothing you thought you were mm but it's wholeness because you realize I am the totality of everything. Hmm. And at the same time, you experience that sense of absolute interconnectedness with everything. Hmm. You are, or I could say I am because you are. Wow. So um, there's no separation. It's like, uh, yeah. And, and, and sometimes we have this, box of god or you know of of the afterlife and we put a lot of ideas in that and then people like you have had these new death experiences blow that off the off the door whatever you know it's just like there's so much more than what we perceive or put in that box within our brains and our and just identification of things you know it goes beyond anything that we could imagine in this physical body yes yes and and when at that moment, I, when, when people asked me, like, there was not concept, there was not, you know, an idea of this or that or color or meaning or movement or it, it, it's so expansive, it's so enormous, it's so, the only words I could use for a state of being like that is pure presence and absolute consciousness. Wow. It was It was just flowing. And I have had later in my life experiences of oneness where 
there's nothing outside of self. <laughs> mm. There's only fluidity and totality and connection. And it's all coming, like flowing from here. There's no here and there. <laughs> it's only, let's call it source and fluidity from that. And when I am in that state of being, my mom finally arrived home. Mm. And then um, this is a, another amazing thing, Jacob, that we live in a big house, but she knew exactly where to go. Mm. Wow. And she went, if she takes longer, imagine the body only can hold, mm. can survive so long. So my mom went to the back of the house now what was the purpose of my oldest sister there she was trying to get me out of the water and people will ask sometimes they ask me why she didn't go to the maid because we didn't supposed to be playing in the patio and look at when you create a fear in a child i'm going to be scolded i have to get her out myself mm. she was too little she mm. could not get me out and the mom the, the moment my mom entered the patio she told my mom, mom, Ingrid is there and I cannot get her. Hmm. And this is another thing. This uh, lady that took care of us, she was mean to us. She was, so imagine a child is not going to go talk to this lady. Then my mom got in the town, got me out. Wow. And now look at about the, the perfection, the synchronicities, the <laughs> alignment with all things. My mom work with children and she had received some training to do cpr for children oh wow wow <laughs> just what are they awesome so much so much like you were explaining like a lot of the illness that you experienced seemed to be a primer or to prepare you for this it seemed like in a way this was all in the playing like mom was prepared you know to handle something that you know who could prepare this as a mother or anyone you know Yes, yes. And I'm going to tell you after when I finish this part how how prepared this was. This was all a pre-plan. And yes, I, I got to learn it later with more clarity. But my mom got me out of the water. She did what she needed to do. I was so disconnected from this body, from this reality, from whatever was happening wow. here that I did not feel absolutely anything like i said to you this body was already a thing of mm. the past <laughs> and i am there in my state of bliss when and this is when you ask me if somebody helped me or asked me anything mm. nobody did is mm. when i felt that i had jumped from the tallest building in the world mm. and the sense was no i did not want to come back and it was the sense of I don't want it, but I was being pulled. There's nothing this force pulled me. There's nothing I could do. I was being vacuumed back. And it was like a magnetic of, pull. Yeah. And you know what was the sense, Jacob? Like I I to me to be able to give some kind of feeling, the felt sense of this is like if you had jumped, like if you jump from a very tall, tall building and you get the sense of vacuum. This like Oh wow! Like like, like, in the, like in the movies, yeah. <laughs> or in an amusement park where you're in one of the things that mm. throw you like that. Imagine that sense of like, mm. and then oh. I'm being vacuumed back, and is when I'm back in the body, I know I am back because the sense of coldness, mm. the lack of freedom, mm. the sense of well-being was gone, and I was now again feeling the sense of like <laughs> reduced to the box right, like, right, right, right. drop here and it i was very angry very very angry wow yes wow. You, you and me both when i had my near-death experiences and i was in the hospital my mother told me that i actually kicked the doctor in the leg who was trying to operate on me oh. so it's it's amazing but as a therapist i think a lot of the anger is a trauma response we but mm -hmm. I also think a lot of it has to do with the contrast and how sometimes we just can't explain what happened, even if we tried in words. And 
but also I just think the frustration of coming back from bliss, you know, to a physically compromised situation, life is hard as it is, but we're coming back to like, it's just such a polar, polar experience that in just such a quick transition. Yes, yes. I also imagine like, <laughs> to make it like more like fun, imagine, like I said, taking a little child to Disney. <laughs> oh, this amusement <laughs> park, you're having all the fun in the world. Yeah. And now the parents, we have to go. Yeah. Oh, you're going to cry through a tantrum. I don't want to go. <laughs> Why? What? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. just put back into school the next the next second, you know, from a Disney ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I want to uh, bring to you a little bit of this idea of pre-planning because there was later in my life when I had the opportunity to ask, and it took many years, many, many years to integrate this experience. Mm -hmm. But later when I was able to ask, and we will get into that after that, I started to communicate with what I call beings of light and all these, but later in my life when I was was able to ask the guidance, many important questions about that experience, but two of those questions were like, why it, my experience happened when I was so young? Mm. And these will, I guess, uh, for your experience too, these will probably touch very, very deep in, in your heart because the answer was, because you were old enough to remember, mm. but young enough not to be conditioned yet. Wow. Say that one more time. Old enough to remember, but young enough to not be conditioned. Wow. Oh. Look at the Powerful. purity of your yeah. experience. Look at the purity of my experience. Is the yeah. experience that were not touched by a before knowledge of that I, look even when i have my child i look really closely at what age he had any concept of death mm -hmm. he was still being four five six before maybe he even knew the word oh this is that but then knowing what that is mm -hmm. it took a while so i'm like oh, and now you've been two three years old and now having an experience like this with the, the purity or there was not before idea what that was, what I knew that experience was, what God was. I didn't even understand it. And now I'm like, oh, I'm in this state of complete awe and union and oneness and <laughs> connection. Yeah. And there's the other thing when I asked the being so like, what was the purpose of this experience? And they say to bring the message of the power of connection. Hmm. And I said, what do you mean? And I said, remember when you saw your body and you left it behind? Yeah, of course. That was a need of the ego. That was an action. There was a decision made by the ego mind because the ego mind always goes with what feels good and mm -hmm. runs away from what feels bad or negative or not or uncomfortable. But they, they said to me, but there was a plan <laughs> that goes beyond the needs of the ego. And that plan was that you were going to come back. Reason why, look at this. You went to look for the maid and you went to look for your mom. Mm -hmm whoa i never even had that clear in my mind like of course you i went to look for help mm. and in my ego mind is like no I didn't, why do you go look for help mm. but my sole purpose was to come back so but look how it goes even deeper what happened when i went to the mate's room no connection this lady even mistreated us, like I mentioned to you. She could not feel anything. Mm. What happened when I went to my mom? A powerful connection, yeah. Exactly, is what we call unconditional love, absolute connection. And this is now the proof that love doesn't have barriers. Mm. Mm. Love 
reunites and talks. This is, the, is what holds the fabric of the universe together. Mm -hmm. And this is the other thing. They said to me, you are the proof mm -hmm. that the communication between the spirit world and the physical world is real. Mm -hmm. Literally living proof, you know, you died, came back and recognized there is no death, but it also seems like there's parallels with the lives that we live over here and when we're over there. When we're connected here, we're connected there. Like the yeah. maid, when we're not connected over here, we're not connected over there too. So there's a lot of parallel forces at hand between the two worlds. Then continuing with what you're saying is when they said, and they show me again, they made, because then I ask, okay, if my mom was one, the one that was going to get me out of the tank, look, it's, it's incredible. Look at the parallax. The person that was the closest to me could not save me. The person that was the farther away was the one that knew where I was or received right. the oh, oh, wow, 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 wow. Yeah. So awareness goes beyond physical proximity or the body. It has no bounds, in other words, or distance, or yeah. Exactly. Look, and it just goes profound, profound, profound. And they said to me, "Look, because when I asked why did I go to the maid room, why why did I go to her room if my mom was the one that's supposed to save me?" Hmm. And again, this word contrast came back. They said, "That's the point." Hmm. Look what happened when there is no love and connection. They will let you drown when there's wow. not love and connection there's division there's separation there's war hmm. Hmm. look what happened when there is love they will find you no matter where you are hmm. Hmm. wow yes it's true of that in our own lives right you know the people yes. that we're closest to i had a friend of mine who was a medium and i met with him you know, the last time before he passed away. And he said, what is love? What is a real friend? He said, you know, when your car is broken down in the middle of nowhere, that friend will find you. That yes. love will find you. No matter what you're going through, there is no barriers. And it seemed for you that was the case with mom. The connecting point is how the pinnacle of your experience and mom's experience just kind of connected, um, you know, and there's just the seesaw. When you were down, she brought you back up, you know, this – undeniable connectivity yes yes and you know when i ask it, it, later in my life the being so like said to me guidance said to me you think that people have children just for the procreation of the species no mm. it's a symbol it's a symbol it's it's a way for humans to know love mm. It's a way, even if it's just a, a, a child or it's a, a pet in some cases or a plant, anything that you devote your heart to, that you share your heart with, becomes a door for you to know love. And it can be done through a ways of appreciation, a ways of gratitude, a ways of joy, a ways of elevated being when we're connected. And then East, but they also said to me, but many people miss the opportunity because we play the role, the role of the mother, the role of the father, the role of this or that. And we forget the true meaning of connection. Wow. We do a lot of the doing, but not enough of the being. You know? Yes. You know, we, have that, we have that checklist off mom, dad, but just because you make a child does not make you a father. It means you procreated, you know, but to really yeah. be a father, really be need to be a mother there needs to be love without that it's just you know offspring basically at that point you know an yes. emptiness yeah yes exactly no. so those are are the some of the, the powerful messages from that experience and and what also makes it that it was impossible to forget the experience jacob and you mentioned one thing of course there was a lot of trauma yes and yes when i came back it did not end there the, so, the trauma or the um experience everything <laughs> oh, yeah the whole the whole thing yeah and the experience itself continued it was like like for me i, I always say 
this is incredible because I always say like like for me it's like the doors never close because after my NDE I kept having what we know today as auto body experiences. Right, right. I get the connection with the beings of light. But you know, I, when I said for me, it's like the doors never close. Later, later, later in life, the being so light said to me after I said it so many times, they're like, okay, okay, we have to clarify this to Ingrid. Of course, the doors never close because in reality, there are no doors. Oh, wow. It's like that Rumi saying, like windows without walls kind of thing, where there's just, it's an illusion of the mind that there is a door. You know, we just have to, you know, not close it it's always open exactly. we, we're the one who blocks it off it's not it's like all of a sudden like we don't go to heaven like heaven's already th always there it's like we have this realm but that light is always there it's not like it just turns on when we die it's it's always there much like if i go to a medium gallery and just sit down at three o'clock in the holiday inn that a medium picks up my loved ones that they decide to come because the medium is there they're always around they just happen to pick up on their presence that's always there. And so absolutely, it is it is windows without walls, as Rumi would say. It's it's pure yeah. connection. There's no uh, separation. Now, I know when I had my near-death experience, I could attest with you where I had many of out-of-body experiences, including one that happened almost to the day 20 years later. Uh, but there's a lot of what was referred to as after-effect gifts of near-death experiences. Would you say that one of the biggest gifts was well, not necessarily gifts, but things that you were able to have post NDE prior to your life, pre NDE was intuitive abilities or just this, you know, you know, rebirth connection, or what would you describe as your profound transformation post NDE? I think remembering. Remembering. The ability that I was, yes, the door of remembering opened. Mm. And it was um, the sense of that connectedness, that sense of like, and my, I again, like I was so young to know the, the word God, I, although I grew up in a Catholic mm -hmm. teachings and everything, but I was two years old, three years old. Yeah, my mom had mentioned, of course, God, God, but I didn't know what God was until I experienced that. And my love for God was such, Jacob, that my heart, my heart was, would just open and connected. And when I even did my first communion, it was like, I was completely, and I've been completely in love with God. Mm. As I experienced that love, that presence, that connection, that when I, I'm telling you, I experienced home, it was that sense of you're never, ever, never alone. Wow. When you get home, what do you feel at home? Home, embrace, warm. You you are in the company of the whole universe. It's like, and then after my NDE, that, that open doors of, or like we said, the door stayed open mm. for that connection with, guides, teachers, what I call beings of light. Mm. I call beings of light because I was a child and it's the way I experienced the presence of the light. Okay. And then all that was for me what, look, I was so little. <laughs> and once I, I started to learn the terminology and everything because my family, my grandmother guided me through the path of spirituality while other kids were playing with dolls and having fun doing other things, I wanted to be enlightened. Mm. You want you 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 tasted it and you felt a little bit deprived and you wanted to just come back to that womb, that warmth. Um, I, I could certainly uh, relate to you. Now, with a lot of clients that I serve in the LGBTQ plus community, you know, we say that there's a coming out party, there's a coming out phase, you know, coming out of the closet, which is associated with that. But there's a similar type experience for a lot of near-death experiencers, which, you know, is like the coming out phase where they get public with the world in a similar challenge to do so, you know, selecting the right people to, to go about it and just the appropriate time as to be able to identify it and to tell people. When were you when you came out of the NDE closet, as they say, like, how old were you where you know, like, whoa, 
this is a near-death experience and I need to tell people about it. I mean, because for me, I was probably in my later teens when I formally understood the term of near-death experience. And then I told people, but, you know, kind of like what PMH Atwater discusses for particularly infants and kids, it takes several decades to usually talk about it. Most kids are not like the kid is like from heaven is for real, where they're telling everyone. I didn't really tell anyone. I kept it very, very private. Was that the similar experience for you? Or did you, you know, tell everyone, you know, that you, that you cross paths with too? No, no, because maybe like it was for you, it was very difficult. And growing up with no understanding of what happened whatsoever, especially from the people around. If I try to mention, talk about it, or imagine when I started to have out of body experiences, talk to beings of light, and I would mention anything, the reaction around was like, this child is dreaming, this child is very creative, this child is like, making these stories so it's like the world around you behaves like a wall and you get now, very stigmatized and ostracized and yes i'm very it's, scared it takes out the air of the balloon of your experiences and yes it starts I'm you really, to start questioning yourself too and like you know I'm, so yeah yeah you have to be very careful who you talk with and it was that a sense of like Look, it, it just was so strong for me, Jacob. I was this, when I came back from my near that experience once, when I saw my parents, it was the sense of like, these are not just my parents, mm -hmm. my biological parents. I felt them as my equal. So for me, it was not easy that I came <laughs> back and I was having the sense of like, I'm not this child. Right. I'm wow. not this child. And I would look at myself in the mirror and cry and say, mom, you don't understand. I'm not this. How can that person get it? And she's like, but you're pretty. You did not. You don't get it. Nobody got it. And I would look at other children and said, what is happening to the people? They don't know anything. Mm. I could not relate to people. I could not relate with anybody. If it wasn't for a couple of things that happened that were very important. One, well, a few things. One this connection with the beings of light, I don't know what I would have done because wow. then that was the thing that started to give me the sense of like home on earth. Like those, those got you through this whole thing and gave you people that understood yeah. you. Yeah, no, I could totally agree. And I, I think sometimes that the near-death experience in moments of suffocation happens in the real world post-NDE. We're in many ways feeling accepted, feeling understood is our oxygen. When that's taken from us, all of a sudden we're put in this very isolated, lonely place. And that's probably the hardest points to be in. But I think yeah. in many ways that allows us to come from a place that knows great pain to define this great purpose that we have, that you are certainly living to a T in your life and being able to speak to the people with that model of that little girl who knew what it was like to not be understood, to not be heard. And now you're using that experience to be able to understand and to be driven to tell your story. Yes. And to open, like you said, to empathy, to compassion, to right. understanding and to the point, like the, the person that was able to start understanding later was the beings of light told me you will never be alone and people will be in your path. Then my mom was the first one that realized, yes, yeah, she's actually really seen talking to someone and revealed to me. So now this is the other thing. I, I, I come, I, I was born in a bloodline of mediums, psychics. Wow, wow. So when I was six years old and I started to see what we call the spirits, when I revealed to my mom and she said that she could see, I didn't know what a spirit was. She's like, I said, mom, no, the beings of light spirits are not the same because now I am seeing all these different beings. Wow. And then I started to know the difference and I, it was all about different kind of vibrational frequencies. And so now I have this part of the understanding and now my grandmother Came to be part of my life too and she brought the spirituality into my life because otherwise i would probably just stay at the level of experience mm. and no deadness 
Mm-hmm. And now my grandmother told me how to meditate. I've been meditating since I was eight years old. Oh, wow. wow. So you had a lot of help that came your way. And it seems like, a you know, it's funny. I'm laughing because you are my second guest this month who has Colombian ties, who's also had a near-death experience that mentions the strong intuitive capabilities that runs in the family. So it must be, you know, something, you know, in the, yeah, I think we're all intuitive as spiritual beings, but some pockets of the earth in our genetics and our environments may be suitable for that to be stronger than let's say other cultures. It's, it's so it seems like there's a very strong and yeah, you know, it's, that's, that's interesting. And that's interesting observation I picked up. Yeah. That's a very interesting thing. And, and then imagine, like I said to you, I was eight, nine, all nine years old. My grandmother is giving me books like the Bhagavad Gita. Books oh, of discernment, well, books of self realization. <laughs> I'm reading these while other people, kids are playing with Barbies or dolls. And wow. I'm like, so by the time I, I am in college, mm-hmm. is when I made the decision like, I want to be like everyone else. Mm-hmm. And people sometimes ask them, and I wrote it in my book, how at this point I made the decision to cut my connection with the beings of light. And people, how could you do that? And I said, like you were mentioning, Jacob, there's a moment where your sense of wanting to be like everyone else is so big mm-hmm. that wanting to just <laughs> have the sense of belonging is so big that you have to make that decision. I, I needed to also ground and put my feet on earth because I would like a helio balloon i was floating there in the in the clouds then you know there was a moment um i also mentioned in in my life later i said i wanted to be like everyone else and the being so i said to me no (laughs) you were not looking to be like anyone else you wanted to belong Mm. and you wanted to be love Mm. so that sense of wanting to belong brought me to make the decision i was uh, i i 16 or 18 years old 19 years old when i just cut that connection and i stopped talking about it mm-hmm. because before that i would talk about the spirituality not about my relationship with the beings of light mm-hmm. or really in that my near there i would just tell you yeah, i drown blah blah but never to the deafness because nobody understood and the beings of light told me when I was five years old, don't talk about us. They're not going to understand. Mm. You kept it. It's very sacred. You kept it within. Um, there's a lot of water analogies that I could certainly reference, you know, like a leaf in water, and now you're generating a current, but also that beach ball that you're trying to push down the water, and eventually it comes up. So my question is, is when did that beach ball just pop up on the surface of the water you know, much like you did when you were saved, you know, um, when did it come up and you're like, I, I can't do this anymore. I need to own this experience. I need to own my truth. Many, many years later, <laughs> and after going through a lot of hardship. Mm. So I was a uh, 39 years old and I had gone through a lot of traumas, a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges. I had lived in a war zone. I I um, became a marine biologist, marine scientist. I, I, I became very successful in my career, but I faced a lot of challenges through all my life. And then I reached the point where I, um, I just felt the sense of my heart pretty much screaming for change. And then I was invited, I, I think at this point, I'm... I'm working with nasa and then i was invited to um visit a friend in um in asia Mm -hmm. and then she told me that she was going to meet the dalai lama and then if i wanted to go meet the dalai lama and i said of course i want to meet the dalai lama i've been wanting to meet him since i was a child and then she said, okay, let's let's do it. And I, it was a trip I did to Singapore. Then I did to uh, Malaysia where I visited this wow. friend. And then 
we program everything and everything happened like it was incredibly all the synchronicities that happened for me to be able to be later in dharamsala india hmm. meeting the dalai lama and i oh. spent seven weeks seven days with him sorry seven days of receiving his teachings uh, in person and wow. so there was a moment when i'm holding his hand hmm. and my mind is when i said i have to it was like accessing the library of my mind and asking for the 10 thousand things i could ask to the dalai <laughs> at that moment like, yeah and it's when i said stop stop just be mm. and in the business of that moment i went quiet and then is when that sense of needing to go back to the deafness of who I was knocked the door. And then in that trip in, in India, I had a car accident, a bunch of stuff happened. And then it was at that moment when I just, oh God, Jacob, I have this story. So you want to take time because then this phone is making. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, the Dalai Lama, being in the presence of the Dalai Lama seemed to be uh, a big opener for you. But I think it reminded you that there was nothing to do but simply to be and to be in that, be, to uh, be, that, that yeah. zero point where, yeah, I mean, I know in, meta, in a lot of Buddhist traditions, they talk about that zero point or that 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 place of empty wholeness and you know there in a lot of our society we're just we're taught more is better but in the way less separations less barriers means more connectivity less things around us that we're dependent on to be happy allows us to have the journey within and to focus on the things that we do have making the most of it and not needing things outside of us to really determine our status so yeah yes and when I came back from that trip, yes, j just like it was that sense of feeling and knowing that although I always kept my sense of, of course, spirituality and I have lost that a lot of that connection, I have become very distracted. Mm. And in that distraction, I have again forgotten who I truly was. And then, yeah, I became a really good scientist, everything else, but it was like, now I enter into this very, very deep depression. So it's incredible how having that sense of the realization of I have lost the way by experiencing a moment of presence brought me to a very deep sense of urge and this depression that told me, you have forgotten who you are. Mm. And when I entered in that very, very, very deep depression, actually all my life I had suffered a, a degree of depression because it was the existential depression of feeling that sense of wanting to be home. Mm. I was, I was, I came back from my NDE, like I said to you with the scream of, I don't want to come back. I had a second near that experience when I was 24. Oh, and again, yeah. <laughs> I was sent back without me being yeah. able, nobody asked me nothing. It was, I was back again. And the two times, see, so now I, I held in my heart that sense of like, I want to be there. I want to be there. And maybe we'll have time to talk about this because there's so much, I don't know. But it wasn't until my third near that experience that happened in 2022 hmm. that I finally understood home and for viewers who haven't had a near-death experience um i know the common question that's asked as well you've had this you can understand it, but but i don't um to put in those words like how could you describe home because to me i think we all know it and i think that's why people listen to it as a degree of recollection but for you home is you would say like a place of belonging a place of love a place of just being seen and understood you would say is that it or 
Gosh, yes, and cuddle. Right. And the, <laughs> and the warmth and in yeah. our in our world, we're always taught that we have to earn things. Like you need to do something to be something. You need to, you know, there's a conditional love within so much of our lives from you know, our jobs to our relationships, you know, to, to everything. It's like, it's all minute to minute we're evaluated. And when you're there on the other side, you're loved for who you are. And that's the core, the core you. And there's no time, there's nothing to do. You're just love for just who you are. And I think people need to remember that. Um, I wanted to ask a question before we wrap up, which is, I've noticed a very big correlationship many times with near-death experiencers and the lives that they live. Like, for example, a lot of near-death experiencers that I've interviewed that I know are in the media field. And it seems like that has prepared them in a way to get their message out. Hello, what are we using? You know, media platforms, communications. So it seems like for whatever reason, you know, the life that we, the life path that we had helps us, you know, eventually with, with the spiritual work that we do. I'm wondering for you, was there any correlation with marine biology and what happened to you? Or those were two totally separate entities that have nothing to do with each other. They're just, I'm just, I'm just kind of curious to see if there was parallels with that. Oh, there's many parallels and we need to, you know, all of us, this, the universe is so, the wisdom of the universe that can bring us no matter what we do and prepare us in different fields to be able to bring the message to people that probably would not have got it if it wasn't for us pre being prepared in different fields. And for me, when people say, how could you become a marine scientist if you drown? Mm. And I said, that's an amazing thing. And I said, because in my case, drowning brought me to see the light. Mm. And later in my career as a marine scientist, I developed many projects that were um, done to bring consciousness to mm. people about the environment and mm. remind people we are nature. And really, really, really big projects where people learn to use the resources in a manageable way. It wasn't about prohibiting. It mm. was about teaching them the interconnection and the sense of belonging and the sense of beingness with the environment and how to use it. So incredibly, yeah, this was amazing. I have traveled the world, Jacob. I have been in 62 countries of the world. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and wow. a lot of this travel was done when I was being a scientist and sure. on board of a scientific uh, ships all over the world. And I was able to combine this hmm. incredible science, technology, and spirituality because I would meet people wherever I hmm. went. And on board of these ships, you would imagine how you're going to meet that are related with this kind of, hmm. you know, do and many people and then you will find people that i'm so glad i met you because i never could talk about this with anybody else wow wow yeah so, i mean sometimes we just feel we have to go to an ashram or yoga center to have a spiritual conversation but at our core you know we're all spirits and no matter where we're doing what we're doing where we are there's that spark that divine spark and so yeah. i'm glad you're able to transform what i refer to as the ego system versus the ecosystem <laughs> and, and and to allow people to see themselves as a part of a greater co um greater connectivity and yeah i mean you're right you know there's the ego system that's going on today which is drill ba baby drill and let's avoid the consequences screw the future i don't care let's deny facts and let's just put my ego over that or ones that really look at the hard science and say, geez, we're on a ticking time bomb if we don't reverse the course. And so I'm glad you're really able to do it because it's not only, you know, it's helpful to have that connection, but literally our survival and our continuity depends on our ability to see beyond the self and to look at the facts beyond mm -hmm. the immediate gains, which has been a pitfall of, you know, almost any civilization when they put the ego, um, they, when they put the me over the we. You know, that's, yes, that's yes, yes. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, completing your, your, even your question about when I came to the light to talk about all these, it was with all these, it came the moment and after overcoming 
this time of depression, it, it came the moment, I, I think depression ended for me when I realized there's a whole world outside of myself that needs light. Mm. How can I serve? How can I serve? When the door of service opened, it was that sense of like, I realized by sharing the light mm. of whatever I even understanding I had at the beginning of my experience could open the door for many others and how whatever clarity understanding openness and, and uh softness of the heart i had i could share wow. and i said i become at this moment it was after another experience a vehicle to serve god I said wow. god use me because that was what i came to do from the very beginning and when i asked the being so like what is purpose and what is mission hmm. they said Ingrid, your purpose is the purpose of anybody else, regardless of what you do, is to remember that you are the light, <laughs> that you are the light of consciousness. You are that spark of God, that divine, eternal mm -hmm. being. And your mission is to shine that light no wow. matter where you are as a scientist as a doctor as a, a psychologist as a mom as a whatever right. you do in the bank in the park with your children shine that light be who you are be true to you are it just shows you you know when you abandon that you know there was a lot of things happen you know and once you were able to own that it seemed like your own happiness, your own light shined. And as Ram Das would say, we're here to, to love, serve, and remember. And I yep. think the God realization is really through service, but beyond service, we have to connect to that light first so it could shine from the inner uh, to the outer. Well, Ingrid, you certainly took us from, you know, potentially the shallow waters of life, and we we're able to enter the deep waters of the mind and the spirit here through your experience. Uh, for viewers who do want to get in touch with you, my question is twofold. A, what is the best? And B, um, do you have you know upcoming events where they could find you? And also C, threefold, the Holy Trinity. Tell us a little bit about your book and where is the best place that you know my viewers could purchase a brightly guided life. Yes. So the way to get in contact with me, I have a website, ingridhonkala.com. I also have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm and where i'm just starting a new podcast too and yeah. i share teachings and all kind of cool stuff and then all the media pages i also offer one-on-ones with uh clients and then i also do mentorings and uh, offer classes and right now i am almost uh, i am on my way soon to europe Mm. I will wow. be doing a, a speaking tour in Europe and a spiritual retreat. It all started as a spiritual retreat in a city close to Barcelona, Spain. And now it evolved to, I've been speaking in 10 different venues, three different mm. countries, eight different cities. So it's just incredible, incredible. How, again, is God bring me where I can serve the most? Wow. So flow with that guidance so yeah. you're like a, you're like a spiritual rock star you're, oh. yeah. oh, <laughs> yeah. you're like elvis presley i love it yeah <laughs> oh. and, and my book uh, they can people can find it on amazon it's in english and in spanish and again is the work of service uh, that was a good reminder when the being so i was afraid and i said i don't know about this book mm. and the being so i said this is nothing to do with you and everything that you're doing for others. Hmm. So. Life isn't about us, it's about others. Yes, so true. Well, Ingrid, man, uh, we could talk all day. We have so many parallels. We'd love to have you come back on, but I do encourage my viewers to check out your website, your incredible book, and to look at some of your events for some of my international viewers to meet Ingrid in person, um, you know, and to check out her upcoming events nationally and internationally. Uh, nationally here in the States and internationally here in the world where 
Well, Ingrid, my NDE sister, I couldn't thank you enough for sharing your incredible insight um, and profound transformation uh, here before us today. And uh, you're welcome back at any time. So I do thank you so much for your generous time and incredible insight for my viewers. Oh, thank you so, so much, Jacob, for having me here again. It's a blessing, it's an honor, and anytime, anytime. All right, make it happen. Viewers, please do find her. You can find her also Facebook, I believe Instagram, her website. So all things, you know, Ingrid, you know, please gravitate to because you're in good hands. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you all for tuning in to a great conversation with Dr. Ingrid Hankala. It was a wonderful dialogue. I know you saw the parallels, I'm sure, between, you know, Dr. Ingrid and myself and just shows you how connected we are, but more apparent. More importantly, Ingrid had so much insight, so much um, understanding from a near-death experience, and it's really you know, shown bright and clear in the life that she lives today. So I thank you all for tuning in. Catch us here next week on the Wisdom of Jacob's Ladder for my next upcoming guest. Thank you all, and we'll see you then. Mm -hmm.